right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this online virtual basic sky one class. Uh, my name is Morgan Sims. I'm a meteorologist here with the National Weather Service office in Moorhead City, North Carolina. I've been here just over three years. Uh, really glad to have you guys along, um, especially fitting to have a, a class today uh, on April 27th. Uh, for severe weather enthusiasts, that date may be familiar. This is the 10-year anniversary of uh, what some people dub the second super outbreak across Alabama and Mississippi, uh, much of the uh, Gulf states uh, 10, years, uh, 10 years ago uh, today. So kind of fitting we're talking about severe weather and specifically uh, severe weather spotting. Um, uh, on this anniversary. A couple of things I'd like to note uh, for you. Uh, if you check the handout section uh, in your display, I have two documents in there. Uh, one is the certificate uh, of completion certifying that you've uh, gone through this course and you are a, a certified Skywarm spotter. Go ahead and save that and you can uh, print that out or at least keep an electronic copy of it. And the second one is the PDF of this presentation that we're going to go through. Um, on the off chance uh, that we lose internet connection uh, here, you will at least have that. Uh, you will at least have that document that you can go through. And also, after the presentation is over, if you want to go through, uh, review some of the slides at any point after uh, we're finished today, uh, that document is there for you. Last thing uh, I just want to touch on is I don't want this to just be a pure lecture. Um, I, I enjoy interaction. We have a few poll questions. Uh, so we'd like to make this interactive. And then at the uh, end of the uh, at the end of this, then we will go ahead and uh, take a uh, few questions. On the technical side of uh, things, uh, your mics have all been muted, um, so you can uh, your your mics have all been muted. But again, at the end of uh, the class, uh, you can certainly do a few things to interact with me. Um, you can raise uh, your hand at the end of the presentation, uh, and we can uh, call on you. We'll unmute uh, your mic, and we can uh, take your question verbally. Um, otherwise, at any point during the presentation. Um, you can type in question, type in a uh, question, and uh, let me pull this up here in this little question box here. You can type in a question at any point, and we will uh, try to get to it uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, one other thing, you can enlarge the presentation. You can either drag uh, the dis the window to enlarge it. If you're on your phone, you can swipe right or left uh, on the app to uh, make it full screen. We will be recording just the presentation part, um, uh, just this particular presentation and posting it uh, on YouTube uh, in the coming days. All right, so again, just a quick review here. If you want to communicate, uh, with me at any point, just feel free to type a question or comment into the uh, chat box um, or at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you want to ask a question verbally, just click that uh, raised hand uh, icon and uh, at the end of the presentation, and I will unmute you and you can ask your question. This is our fourth year of uh, doing online classes. We've done a uh, mix of different Skywarns. This is the basic uh, class. We've also we also do an advanced Sky One class uh, for those who are uh, want to get deeper uh, into the uh, science. We initially try to focus more on you know how to report se uh, severe weather to us, uh, but the advanced Sky One getting more into the science is our gift back to you. Uh, we also do Sky One for flooding, for tropical, uh, and for winter and uh, we regularly announce those on our website and through social media. So definitely keep an eye out for those. Um, the goal today uh, is hopefully uh, what you take away from this course is you'll know more about the weather service itself uh, and severe weather. Um, also, the, the key part, if there's one thing um, 
one ultimate takeaway from today is how to report severe weather to us and how important that is, especially uh, for our warning purposes. We have uh, your emails, the emails that you use to uh, register uh, for this course. So you will uh, now be in our spotter database simply by attending this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, we have info in case you need to uh, reach out. You, you're you're uh, logged uh, in our uh, records here. So this is going to be about an hour total of the class itself is going to run about 50 minutes uh, and then the last 10 minutes or so give or take uh, we'll take questions from you and that will last uh, so that all together that'll last about uh, an hour a few of the topics we're going to hit today uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the weather service in general uh, just a little bit about skywarn and what it is and then we'll start to get into the nitty-gritty we're going to talk about thunderstorms uh, they're the ingredients you need to get thunderstorms, the life cycle of a thunderstorm, and then the different types of thunderstorms that we deal with, uh, whether it be single cell, uh, squall lines and bow echoes, or supercells uh, and tornadoes. We'll touch briefly on flash flooding and then keep how to uh, stay informed of severe weather. And then at the end of all of this, we'll do a review of the spotter procedures. A few things to keep in mind here. Um, we're going to be hitting a lot of information in the next 50 minutes. I don't expect any of you to be able to absorb all of this in one class. Um, like I said earlier, we want to give you a little bit of science uh, so that you understand why storms occur. Uh, but the main goal of this particular talk is uh, making sure that you understand how to report to us uh, when severe weather happens. So definitely enjoy the class. Uh, we certainly enjoy uh, presenting this as much as you guys probably enjoy seeing the material, but make sure to pay special attention to what to report, how to report it, and when. And again, don't forget uh, to ask questions. So when the weather turns severe, that's where our uh, agency uh, really, uh, really uh, shines. Our ultimate mission is to protect life and property and to enhance the national economy. Uh, that national economy bit makes sense when we think that we're in under the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, where the uh, federal government, uh, weather is one of the uh, biggest factors in impacting our uh, overall national economy. So that is why we are where we are uh, within the federal government. Um, we, Our job is to issue warnings to alert you of severe weather, whether it be, uh, you know, thunderstorms, floods, blizzards, ice storms, high winds, and for uh, uh, much more familiar, uh, much more familiar to folks right along here in eastern North Carolina, hurricanes and uh, coastal storms. Uh, we're just one office of 122 uh, across the country. Um, several offices, this little jigsaw shape here, uh, several offices uh, um, across the lower 48. Uh, here's the Newport office, but we have Wilmington to our south, Raleigh to our west, and Wakefield, Virginia to our north. Uh, we also have offices up in Alaska, and then also a few offices in Hawaii, out in Guam. Uh, we have an office in Puerto Rico, and we ha even have a uh, office out in uh, American Samoa. So we definitely reach out globally. Uh, if you are in this class, and you are not from Eastern North Carolina, that's perfectly fine, welcome aboard. Um, we will go ahead and forward your information to uh, whatever uh, local office you may uh, fall under. So about our office, um, our local office here, we cover just the Eastern portion of North, uh, North Carolina. Not uh, exact, but roughly uh, the area to North Carolina east of Interstate 95. Uh, and we have a pretty dynamic area that we do a forecast for. We've got our land areas stretching all the way from Jacksonville up to Williamston. Uh, we've got the Outer Banks, but we also have uh, rivers and sounds, uh, and then also the offshore waters. Um, we do forecasts and warnings in this yellow zone here. Uh, this yellow zone stretches offshore about 20 nautical miles. Um, so we do both forecasts and warnings for that. Once you get beyond 20 nautical miles here, 
uh, 20 to 40, we only do warnings for that point. Um, 20 to 40 nautical miles, uh, those waters are actually taken care of by a uh, national center based up in Washington, D.C., the uh, Ocean Prediction Center, and they cover high seas forecasts uh, for pretty much the rest of the Atlantic and a good chunk of the uh, Pacific. Uh, other portions of North Carolina are covered by other offices, like I mentioned, uh, the Wilmington office, the Raleigh office, uh, Wakefield, Virginia covers uh, counties on the northern side of the Albemarle Sound, and then out west uh, we have the mountainous areas covered by offices like Greenville, Spartanburg, and uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. We are a 24-7, 365 institution. The earth never stops spinning, the weather never stops happening, so we are constantly keeping an eye on it, uh, working rotating uh, working rotating shifts uh, in order to uh, keep an eye on the weather and keep uh, you and your property safe. Um, in an extreme case, we can certainly call this office home uh, for several days. Uh, Hurricane Florence was one of those uh, examples. Um, I was barely here six months when Hurricane Florence came in. It was a heck of a welcome uh, to the agency. We were here uh, for three to around seven days, depending on when electricity and whatnot started to come back. Uh, our building is designed to uh, withst withstand strong storms uh, like this. We have hurricane shutters uh, for the windows and, and for the doors. Uh, this office is where our uh, warning coordinator, coordination meteorologist stayed. He's got his air mattress up. So we literally slept, woke up, and basically lived our lives in this office uh, for a good chunk of that week. So when the weather gets bad, bad uh, we stay put so that we can fulfill our uh, agency mission. We're going to touch briefly here on Skywarn. Uh, Skywarn is a national volunteer program that's run by our agency. And its goal is to provide the weather service with ground truth reports of significant weather. And when I say ground truth, it's you know reports of we have trees down, we have power lines down, we're seeing hail of this size, or I see a uh, I see a funnel cloud or a tornado. Uh, and this is the organization that you will. Uh, this is the program that you will be a part of. And I, I can't emphasize enough how important being a weather spotter is. Uh, to our agency, uh, specifically because these are real-time reports. It helps us in our warning uh, decision. Uh, it helps us gauge how severe a storm is. We have a bunch of tools to look at the atmosphere and assess storms. We have our Doppler radar. Uh, we have satellite. And our tools have come a long way just in the last 20 years or so. We have uh, ways of detecting lightning, uh, really good lightning detection networks that uh, we can use. Satellite images used to only come in every 15 minutes. Now, depending on the situation, we get a satellite image every 30 seconds. That being said, there is nothing that trumps um, ground truth, ground reports of actually hearing about the damage. We, we can't see that uh, through all of our tools. So your information that you provide may be a reason that a warning is issued or it gives us a reason to uh, continue or even upgrade a uh, warning if necessary. So the info that you provide helps everybody else um, because then we can communicate that info in our warning uh, with potentially life-saving information. Uh, and this is also the backbone uh, for our emergency communications. So far and away, the your trained eye as a storm spotter is going to be our greatest asset during the uh, warning process whenever severe weather is around. I'm going to touch on a few fundamental definitions here. Um, I'm going to lay these down before we really start to uh, get into how to report. Um, a few of these you're probably familiar with. Um, we're going to talk, if we have a watch out, uh, which is issued by the uh, Storm Prediction Center, that means that conditions are favorable for whatever weather event is being uh, discussed in or near the uh, watch area. Um, a favorite analogy around here, especially uh, in the past year, as some of us have started to take up baking, is think about if you're making a, a cake or if you're making brownies. When we say we have a watch out, you know, you have the ingredients out, you've got the eggs in the bowl, you've got the, the cocoa powder and the sugar and all that, but it's not really 
mixed up yet. The conditions are there for brownies, but it, they, they aren't quite happening yet. Uh, a warning means that, okay, well, it's imminent or it's occurring. Uh, and this can be issued by uh, whatever, whatever office is responsible for that county. Going back to the baking analogy, this basically means, okay, the timer on the oven's going off, uh, the brownies are just about ready. So just to reemphasize that, watch means, you know, the ingredients are there, but they just haven't come together yet. Warning means the ingredients have come together uh, and the hazard is imminent or it is occurring. Uh, most of our warnings around here are going to be for severe thunderstorms. Um, by definition, a uh, severe thunderstorm is any storm that produces hail of one inch diameter or larger or wind gusts about 58 miles per hour or stronger. And those values are based on, well, at what point uh, hail size and what uh, point when do we start to see uh, damage? And uh, based on a collection of uh, surveys and studies, one inch hail and 58 mile per hour or stronger winds. Um, severe thunderstorms also, um, you, you know, can produce tornadoes, at which point we put out a, a tornado warning. I will note the one thing uh, that isn't on here is lightning. Um, all thunderstorms have lightning. Uh, lightning does, a, does not necessarily make a severe thunderstorm. It's certainly dangerous uh, in all cases, uh, but that alone does not a severe thunderstorm make. Few other definitions here, um, and this one we're gonna hit on at the end of the presentation. A tornado and a funnel cloud. We're gonna talk about tornado first. It's a violently rotating column of air uh, pendant uh, from a thunderstorm. Here's the key thing. A tornado is in contact with the ground. That is what differentiates a tornado from a funnel cloud. A funnel cloud, again, you know, a pendant extending um, from the base of a thunderstorm cloud, but it hasn't reached uh, the ground. It certainly exhibits rapid rotation uh, and it looks pretty smooth in, in appearance, um, but it hasn't reached the ground yet. And that's the differentiating factor between a funnel cloud and a tornado. Now, in terms of reporting, we want to know about both of either of these. You know, if you see a tornado, call us. If you see a funnel cloud, uh, call us or get a hold of us. Both of these are important for us to know about but differentiating uh, between the two uh, is important. So one more time, funnel cloud does not reach the ground. Tornado in contact uh, with the ground. I'd like to talk about our website uh, for a, a little bit. This is uh, where you can get weather information of all kinds, either whether it be from past events, uh, current weather, uh, what's happening right now, and the forecast out to seven days. Uh, I highly encourage you to bookmark this website uh, and explore around. It's got a lot of different resources and you can use it to whatever whatever really serves your purpose, whether you just need a simple seven day forecast or if you're looking, if you're a uh, boater or a fisherman and you wanna know the uh, forecast out for uh, you know the big rock area or uh, whatnot. Um, we also have briefings for those who want a little more uh, details. So go. You need to go. You can go in depth as much as you need. Um, a few of our main hallmarks: uh, seven-day forecast, which we talk about sky cover, uh, the highs and lows, the the winds and the chance of pre precipitation. Your standard uh, seven-day forecast, um, seven-day forecast uh, parameters. Um, this is probably one of my most favorite parts of the. Uh, of the website is we have an hourly forecast and this you can really customize based on your interest you can check on or off any weather parameter uh, that you want um, here we've only got you know sky cover temperature and wind but you can certainly add more elements such as dew point we also have customizable often uh, options for anybody who's got marine interest you can see wave height and wave period uh, if anybody here is a pilot um, we have aviation uh, parameters uh, as well. So you can see hourly trends um, that you just uh, won't be able to, uh, that uh, detailed hourly trends that we just don't uh, have the space to mention uh, in the seven day forecast. Uh, when we have more inclement weather happening, whether it be a coastal storm or any tropical system or severe weather, then we will uh, create 
weather briefings, uh, which you can find down near the bottom of our webpage, there'll be this weather hazard briefing uh, section. And uh, these will usually be uh, PowerPoint, multi-slide PowerPoints talking about various hazards. This is really detailed information. So when we got a big event rolling through and you want to um, really see the details, uh, the uh, hazard briefing is certainly a way to look at it. Here's a couple examples of what, we, what we've done. Um, top left here is uh, one of the slides, our impacts expected from Hurricane Florence, pretty much extreme off the board, especially the rainfall. Uh, you know, a few spots got over 30 inches of rain from that. Uh, and then also that really big winter storm that we had uh, at the beginning of uh, 2018. Uh, again, talking about confidence and whatnot. And this is just one slide of uh, many. There's a wealth of information here. Um, we're also on social media. Uh, forgot one element here. We've got Facebook. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, but now we're also a relatively new development. We're also on Instagram. Um, so we've got various platforms uh, to uh, communicate our information on which you can uh, follow us. Um, this is actually a uh, Facebook Live video uh, that we did back uh, for a uh, severe weather uh, event in April of uh, 2020, right when we were starting to go uh, all virtual. So we have multiple different ways that we'll talk about uh, talk about weather. So I encourage you to search us out on uh, social media, uh, like us, uh, follow us, subscribe to us. Uh, Another really nice thing, we don't formally have an app, uh, but we do have a mobile website, mobile.weather.gov. Uh, and this is, a, this is a really nice website to bookmark on your phone so you can quickly access it. Uh, you can still get the same thing we all looked at. Looked at. We can, you can look at the hourly forecast, you can look at radar, you can look at any more info from our office. And most importantly, you can just change the location to anywhere. Uh, in the country, our, our forecast grids that we work with are only you know two and a half kilometers um, by two and a half kilometers. So there are grid points all over the all over the place. Um, you know, for example, you click on Hatteras Island, uh, or you look at Hatteras Island. The forecast there is going to be different than if you look at New Bern. If you go out west uh, to say the Asheville area and you go up into the mountains, you're going to notice. Um, you know, you, you'll definitely notice a cooler forecast for higher elevations and in even more extreme sense, if you went out to say, look at the uh, Colorado uh, Rockies or any of the mountains out west, you certainly uh, see that element as well. Uh, the mobile.weather.gov site also works on PCs. So I'm going to back out of here uh, for just a minute. I have the uh, website pulled up here. So this is our website. Uh, today, this is weather.gov slash MHX. Um, uh, for example, I'm just going to click here on the uh, basically the Newport area. Just click anywhere on the map, and here is your particular forecast um, for that particular grid point. Uh, so very nice day out there, although the uh, humidity is starting to crawl up a little bit. Uh, first taste, taste of spring coming up this week. Um, but you'll notice here, this little green box here, is is um, where this forecast is for. Uh, if you live in a different area, for example, if you live down in the Brandywine uh, area, you can just click that area and the forecast isn't gonna change a whole lot. Although here you might notice we had a high of 81 uh, for that last point I clicked and now it's jumped down uh, to 78 uh, for this uh, particular area. Um, so you can really get down into the really get down and detailed uh, with all these different grid points and see a uh, customized uh, forecast. Uh, you can also do this for marine areas. So if I click just offshore here of uh, Pine Knoll Shores, then you get a point forecast for our marine zones uh, for that particular uh, stretch of water. So really, really nice uh, resource here. And again, you can look at all of this on a uh, mobile spot. Uh, here's that weather hazard briefing section that we talked about. We don't have any briefing uh, active at this point. Our uh, social media feed uh, that you can view within our website. 
and then the weather story, which is relatively new, but it's a quick and easy way to just see, well, here's the big uh, hazards you're worried about today. In particular, it was just our warming weather and we have a moderate rip, uh, risk of rip currents up for uh, all of our beaches. All right, we're gonna jump back uh, into this uh, presentation here. Uh, a lot of the times when you look on the uh, news or you look on websites, you're going to see uh, forecasts uh, talking about severe weather risk. And a lot of the times you're going to see this as, you know, a level one out of five or a level three out of five. Uh, this is coming from the uh, Storm Prediction Center, which is based out in uh, Norman, uh, Oklahoma, and basically outlines where severe weather is possible for the next one to eight days. And we have risks uh, ranging from just general thunderstorms or a low end marginal risk, which we uh, get quite a bit around here to a slight risk or an enhanced risk. Once we started get, starting getting into a moderate or high risk, we're starting to look at a uh, high likelihood of severe weather and uh, even a uh, potential outbreak. And fitting enough, here is 10 years ago today, uh, April 27th, uh, 2011. And at the time, I was actually living here in Chattanooga uh, at the time uh, when this was happening. Um, so these outlooks are produced every single day out to uh, eight days, and then the day one outlook is regularly updated several times a day. All right, let's jump into the science a little bit. Um, we're here, you know, talking about thunderstorms and reporting severe weather uh, in thunderstorms. Uh, when we talk about what causes thunderstorms, um, again, it's like... Uh, a, a recipe. We need certain things to uh, come together to, you know, get thunderstorms to form. And those th three main elements are moisture, basically how much water or water vapor do we have in the air, instability, uh, do we have an environment where air can rise sufficiently to form uh, thunderstorms, and do we have lift, which is a mechanism to actually force uh, that air upward uh, sufficiently uh, uh, high enough and with enough strength to actually develop uh, thunderstorms. Moisture is not going to be a uh, problem for us. Uh, we've had several moisture uh, sources, either whether it be from the Gulf of Mexico or uh, moisture off the Atlantic Ocean. Since we're a coastal area, we're, we're rarely going to have any trouble getting moisture during the summer. Um, a lot of the moisture uh, that we're getting in the in the coming days uh, are, is streaming off the Gulf of Mexico. But, you know, even though we have more moisture here, you notice we don't really have in the forecast, at least until Friday, uh, any, uh, for, uh, any uh, thunderstorms in the forecast. Um, and again, it's because not all the ingredients are there. Um, instability is a uh, big one. And you can think about this as warm air versus cold air. Um, warm air is lighter than cold air. So if any air or air parcel, as we like to say, is warmer than its surroundings, that air is going to rise. Now, the amount of instability we have in a very rough sense is basically the difference between, you know, how warm the surface is and how cold aloft, uh, cold, how cold the air is aloft. The bigger that difference, the greater the uh, instability. Um, a lot of ways we can uh, warm up uh, the surface of the atmosphere. Uh, nice warm sunny day, especially during the summer, we get uh, all that daytime heating that can really uh, uh, send temps soaring up into the 80s and even the uh, 90s. That heats the uh, air above it. Um, Another way is we can have warmer air actually being blown in. We call that uh, advection. Uh, so uh, there's a, a few ways that we can really uh, crank up the heat uh, at the surface, but we also have to have that cool air aloft, otherwise instability is not gonna be there. Um, I like to refer to a soda, soda bottle um, as an analogy uh, for this. So think of a Coke bottle uh, that's all fizzed up. It's threatening to, uh, you know, it, it's threatening to uh, spill out of the bottle. Um, the Coke itself is the actual moisture source, the moisture that will get lifted up. Uh, and the bubbles are, you know, the instability. It's trying to raise up, but everything is capped here. 
uh, and capping falling off is a atmosphere is a, a meteorological term, um, but nothing's happening right now because we don't have the last ingredient. That last ingredient being a lifting mechanism, and we have a few ways. Um, th there's a few mechanisms in which we can uh, lift air sufficiently to get thunderstorms. The main two are that we're going to talk about are a cold front and a warm front. A uh, cold front. Uh, is basically we have warm air in place and we have colder air advancing in. Uh, like we said, uh, I said earlier, colder air is denser than warmer air. So as this advances through, it's actually going to force the warmer air up above it. Uh, and that's going to force that air to rise uh, up. So if the air is sufficiently unstable, that air is going to keep rising, condense, form clouds, and then uh, you know, if the conditions are right, we will uh, get a thunderstorm uh, forming along uh, this front. Uh, fronts uh, are pretty notorious for initiating lines of showers and thunderstorms, uh, looking, you know, squall lines. Um, uh, you often see squall lines being forced up right uh, along the uh, edge of a uh, cold front. We've also got uh, warm fronts although the incline here is not um, as, you know, as, as severe as a cold front. And the main thing with a warm front here is we've already got a cold air mass here in place. Um, but what happens is as the warm air approaches it, because it's less dense, it's actually going to be forced over the cooler air mass already in place. And again, as we get that warmer air lifted over the cooler air mass, uh, it'll be forced to rise. Again, condensation, precipitation, and uh, potentially thunderstorms. Uh, with a cold front, you're going to generally, because the air is getting forced up a lot more rapidly, you generally get your taller thunderstorms um, with a cold front, but you can still get thunderstorms uh, with a warm front, and you can certainly get uh, still get severe weather out of a warm front. Um, warm fronts can be particularly problematic because um, in terms of the winds that we see, uh, on, a, on a warm front, uh, considering south winds uh, on the warm side of a warm front, more easterly winds to the north, uh, you can get you know, wind shear profiles or wind profiles that are more conducive uh, to uh, tornadoes. And uh, especially if you look out to the Midwest, some of the more robust tornado events that areas like Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa have had have been tornadoes forming in the vicinity of a warm front, not necessarily a, a cold front. So both frontal features uh, can be a source uh, for severe weather. So how are, do you make uh, your report? This is one of the uh, key components that I, I want you to take away from this class. And we're going to hit a number of methods here. Uh, the first one, we have a phone number specifically dedicated uh, to taking spotter uh, info. And this is for this particular office again if you're not uh, if you're in an area that we don't uh, cover um, we will forward your info along to that office and they can provide you with uh, uh, the email addresses or the phone phone number or whatever platforms they have for you uh, to report uh, severe weather so here's our number uh, right here specific to eastern uh, North Carolina and it rings directly to us and the key thing here is we just want reports uh, on this number, and we're going to be probably most likely pretty busy uh, when you call. So, a uh, quick script to remember uh, when you call us: we want to know who you are. I'm a trained skywarn or a skywarn spotter. What did you see? Did you see a funnel cloud, hail? Uh, if you saw hail or wind damage, um, you know, if we need to follow up with you on that, we'll ask you a few questions like how big was the hail or what size were the tree branches or what happened. Where did you see it? Uh, was it in Newport? Was it in Jacksonville? Uh, was it in Greenville? And when did you see it? It can either be a specific time, 645 or whatnot, or you can say, I just saw it three minutes ago. Um, and the one thing I want to emphasize here is if weather is happening right on top of you, uh, you know, safety first, you know, take take the proper safety precautions and it is perfectly fine uh, after the event has passed uh, to then, once it is safe to do so, uh, get a hold of us uh, and uh, let us know what you saw. Uh, if you 
can't call us for whatever reason, uh, you can definitely email us uh, at this email uh, address listed here. Uh, I will say this uh, capital W here, you can, it, it can either be capital or lowercase, it doesn't matter. It's wxobs.nhx, that's our office identifier, at noaa.gov. And again, we, we only want reports through here. It's the same format though, who you are, what you saw, where you saw it, and when you saw it. Uh, same format as if you were calling us. All right. Uh, so not all thunderstorms are the same. Um, we've got different classifications of uh, thunderstorms uh, and their general severity. Um, you can look at it here on this. Let me get the uh, laser pointer back up. You can look at it here uh, on this little scale here uh, from single cell as we move on to the right here, multi-cell cluster, multi-cell line, like a squall line and then a super cell. The farther right, on the scale you go, generally the higher uh, threat um, these uh, different types of storms um, have. And a lot of the differentiating factors here are the strength of the updraft and uh, how much a wind shear we have. And I will explain what wind shear is uh, in a little bit. Our single cell storms are probably our most common. Um, and we see these a ton across all of the uh, deep south uh, during the summer. Um, sometimes we'll refer to them as garden variety or we'll call them little popcorn storms or pop-up thunderstorms. Um, so if we look at, look at this picture, I want you to notice how the cloud is towering and it looks a bit bubbly. Uh, you know, it looks like your cumulus cloud uh, generally. It looks kind of like it has a cauliflower shape to it. Um, so we do have some instability around. Other thing I want you to know is that the cloud is oriented straight up and down. There's no tilt to it. Uh, that's generally a sign that we don't have a lot of wind shear. When a storm is built straight in the vertical like that, it's going to generally reduce its chances of lasting a, a long time. The, uh, the reason for that is, uh, to put it simply, when we're dealing with a thunderstorm, we have an updraft and we have a downdraft. And if we have something that can keep the updraft and the downdraft separated, the storm's gonna last longer, uh, specifically wind shear. But these type of storms, that generally isn't around. So what's gonna happen is that downdraft is quickly gonna choke off and kill the updraft and eventually kill the whole storm. So these storms, when we're looking at a time frame here, they don't last long, you know, maybe 20 minutes, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. These are difficult to warn for because, you know, they can produce uh, some uh, severe uh, weather, you know, small hail, maybe some damaging winds, an isolated downburst, certainly some very uh, heavy downpours. Um, you know, we've seen storms of this nature, you know, despite lasting only 20 minutes and, and that one time they can dump over an inch of rain or more. Um, but the storm is generally disorganized and it's it's difficult to predict uh, the likely uh, predict the severity of these storms. Generally, uh, the tornado potential with these is low, but it's not necessarily zero. Um, we will generally see these um, at the intersections of uh, you know boundaries. Um, in particular, for those of us down the, at the coast, it could be the uh, sea breeze advancing inland, uh, or if it's a cooler outflow uh, meeting up with another another boundary. Uh, we can also get storms that pulse up and become more severe if two cells uh, merge together, even if that is a very brief uh, occurrence. I had talked about small hail. We want to know about any size hail uh, that you get, and we want the actual size uh, of the hail. Um, you can use, we have a whole set of common terms here uh, for conveying hail reports to us. Uh, some of the most common terms uh, that we have, um, you know, just a couple weeks ago, we were getting a lot of reports of pea-sized hail, a quarter of an inch. Uh, our severe criteria is generally quarter hail or larger. That being said, please call us if you're getting penny-sized hail or pea-sized hail or nickel-sized tail, because as I referred to at the beginning of this presentation, uh, we want to know, um, you know, based on what we're seeing, well, 
I'm looking at radar here and I'm thinking maybe this is producing quarter inch hail, but if we get a call from one of our spotters saying, well, we're only getting pea-sized hail, we're only getting dime-sized hail, then we know that, okay, well, maybe the uh, maybe the radar is making this look a, a little more nasty than it actually is. So even if it isn't severe-sized hail, we want to know about it for our reference. Um, some of our... Uh, uh, we had that really big storm about a month ago that uh, went through Birdie County and dove down into the Admiral Sound. Um, up in Birdie County, that was actually dropping tennis ball and baseball sized uh, hail at one point. Um, personal favorite descriptor, teacup for three inches. Um, you know, all these uh, uh, sports terms and then a teacup comes out, uh, pretty much comes out of nowhere. That's for three inches. Uh, likelihood of seeing that is a uh, low plus the uh, four inches that kind of hail we generally see out in the midwest but a nice uh, reference uh, to have the one thing we don't want you to do is please do not report hail as marble size uh, specifically because marbles they you know there's no set size of a marble they can call, come in all sorts of different sizes we prefer uh, you know using uh, coinage or you know a baseball or a softball or something like that. Uh, when you're reporting hail to us, we want to know about the largest uh, stone that you have out there. So once it's safe to do so, and you're uh, you're no longer you know it's no longer rainy or the storm has passed, uh, we want to know about the largest uh, stone you have up, have out there. Um, you if you have a ruler, definitely use that. Otherwise, you know if you have some loose change around, just you know. Uh, like this picture down here, just lay a quarter down, see, okay, well, I've got hail roughly the size of quarters, maybe uh, a little bit bigger, and uh, then you can call or email that in to us. So to summarize hail, uh, just briefly here, report any size, make sure to give us the size of the largest stone. Uh, for example, we're getting nickel-sized nickel hail here, uh, but we're getting a few stones as large as a, as a quarter, and please do not uh, use marbles. Uh, to report the size of hail. Going up a step here in severity, now we're getting into the multi-cell uh, storm clusters and lines. Um, these are more likely if we have moderate wind shear. And when I talk about wind shear, uh, a little hard to see on this graphic here, but wind shear is essentially a change in the wind as you go up uh, in the atmosphere. Um, two types of different wind shear, um, just to touch on them, we have uh, speed shear, which is basically the speed of the wind is increasing or, or at least changing uh, as you go up in the atmosphere. And then we also have directional shear, which could be the direction of the wind is changing the higher up in the atmosphere you go. Um, when you're looking at the clouds, a giveaway that we have some wind shear is now we have some tilt uh, to the clouds. You'll notice it isn't straight up. Um, so it's uh, tilted up, which means this is the kind of environment where the updraft and the downdraft can kind of stay separated and the storms can last longer. Uh, and these particular uh, storm systems, uh, they can do what we call train, which is you got multiple cells moving over the same area. Um, and a really big threat with that is flash flooding. Uh, so again, training are multiple storms moving over uh, the same area. Um, Earlier this summer, I remember uh, we had some storms training just on the other side of Duplin County up in over in uh, Sampson County where we had uh, storms training over that area. And they were and we got reports out there of, you know, five to seven to even eight or nine inches of rain out, out in that neck of the woods, all just from generally non-severe storms. But they were all moving over the uh, same spot and flash flooding can be, uh, you know, very significant. Um, when I say significant, it's something that's never or rarely seen. Um, when it comes to flash flooding, when you're going to report that, we want to know before uh, it gets really bad. For example, give us a call if roads are becoming covered with water. Get a hold of us if your local stream is rising really quickly and it's uh, approaching bank full. Uh, we also want to know how deep is the water going to be. We don't want you out there and measuring it, um, considering um, during flash flooding, water can be moving so fast that it can really 
you know, just a few inches of it can knock you off your feet. So just use a reference point like, you know, using a car, is it up to the tires of the car, is it up to the doors of the car, is it up to the roof? Um, are roads washed out or are they completely impossible, uh, impassable? Those are things we want to know uh, in regards to flash flooding. Uh, if you have a rain gauge, uh, we can definitely use those reports. It helps us confirm. Um, we have, uh, radar has a couple algorithms that uh, can estimate rainfall, uh, but your rainfall reports can actually help us gauge how the radar is doing. Um, it helps us know how much rain has fallen. Uh, and at that point, uh, we can use the data we have to figure out, well, what is the potential for flooding? We want to know about rainfall amounts of two inches or greater in 24 hours in particular, or if you get two inches of rain in an hour or, or less. We really want to know about those. Um, and you can do this through the COPARAS network, um, which you might have heard of. It's basically a, uh, it's a, basically a civil scientist uh, organization of folks who have uh, rain gauges and report uh, rainfall pretty much uh, every single day. Um, it's usually between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. It's really simple. You have the rain gauge out there, and then what you do is in the morning, you go out and you measure the rainfall, and then it's either on the Kokoraz website or they have an app. Um, you can, uh, you basically just type in the amount of, amount of rain you had. Kokoraz also gives you the ability, you know, if you get one of those cases where you get two inches of rain in an hour, you can report uh, that type of rainfall uh, and we get that info in real time. You can sign up for this at kokoraz.org. Uh, they have, uh, make sure that you obtain a four inch plastic uh, rain gauge. Uh, and there are sources on that website to order such a rain gauge. Um, and then you can either attend a training, one of our training sessions, or they have an online uh, training slide so that you can go through. Um, make sure you set up the gauge in a good location, not something we don't want a gauge, say, directly under a roof where you will have water dripping into it. It should be well sighted. Um, and then you can start observing precip and reporting online to it daily. And we see that info uh, every single day. Um, some folks may have, uh, you know, more high tech weather stations like a Davis, for example, uh, and those report uh, rainfall as well. That being said, the way they report rainfall, for example, a tipping bucket or sensor, you know, it does okay, but it's just not as accurate as the classic plastic uh, rain gauge pictured here. All right, we're hitting the closing stretch here, um, and then we will take it over to you uh, for uh, questions. Uh, squall lines and multi-cell storms, um, some of the more severe cases uh, that we see, uh, you know, might have some really uh, intense uh, winds with them. Um, and one of the giveaways we might see on radar is what we call a, a bow echo here, which is quite literally, you look at the reflectivity on radar, it's just a bow uh, shaped area of enhanced uh, reflectivity. Um, and the way you can think about this is the uh, cooler downdraft air of the thunderstorm as it's, you can kind of visualize it rushing rushing out here and actually pushing this heavier rainfall out. So if you see this bow shape, you can imagine cooler air coming down to the ground and then rushing, uh, spreading, spreading out and rushing out. And these can kick up some really uh, impressive winds. Um, they, uh, you can usually pick these out from a shelf cloud, which is the leading edge of the gust front uh, right before the higher winds come through. This was actually down at Harker's Island um, back in May of uh, 2017 and our uh, warning coordination meteorologists were actually warning the storm at the time. Um, and this, this storm here produced gusts as high as 82 miles an hour at Fort Macon. Um, winds can certainly been high, be higher than that. We've seen, you know, the occasional case where a microburst can, uh, where, you know, these gust fronts or uh, other features can produce winds up to 100 miles an hour. Um, I'm, the sound might be hard to hear. Uh, looking at this video, you might think, well, there's a lot of wind going hard on in here. Uh, you know, maybe this is a tropical system or whatnot. This is up in Canada. This is a microburst, which is 
kind of like what I was talking about, you have that cool air that really co collapses quickly under the ground and quickly spreads out. Uh, and this is the effect you get is these really, really uh, in, intense winds. Um, and again, you can get them up to 80 to 100 miles an hour, and this can produce a ton of wind damage. You can see here, this thing is uh, knocking trees down uh, with ease. Um, so if you get wind damage, um, here's what we want to know, you know, are trees down or power lines down? What specifically has the wind brought down? How many trees are down? Do you have trees down everywhere? Or is it just an isolated tree? How big are the branches that got knocked down? Knocked down? Was the tree uprooted? Was the tree already dead? That can make a difference. Dead trees are going to be more easily toppled uh, than, uh, than the hardier uh, trees. If you have a really strong wind, um, did you have any damage to the building? Roof tiles blown off or is the roof completely gone? Did you have the uh, windows uh, blown out? Uh, can you estimate the wind speed, which can be difficult, uh, difficult to do, but um, you can kind of use a gauge of, well, I have branches down or, or whatnot. Um, as I understand, most of you probably don't have anemometers on hand and sometimes those weather station anemometers aren't, aren't uh, perfect, uh, but can you estimate the uh, uh, wind speed using kind of the uh, damage around you as a guide? Uh, one last way to report uh, to us, um, you can post on Facebook or you can post on Twitter. Um, pictures really help us out uh, because we can actually visualize that, uh, that damage and see the size of the uh, you know branches or we can actually see the roof blown off, what type of roof it was, uh, et cetera and you can post a picture to our wall. Again, still the same format, who, what, where, and when, who you are, what you saw, where you saw it, and when you saw it. And this is this is the, uh, the mother of all storms, supercells. Uh, these are the ones that are most likely uh, going to form uh, tornadoes, and this is when our wind shear is uh, at its strongest um, the updraft and the downdraft are entirely separated from each other, and this storm is basically like an engine. It can keep itself going uh, for hours. Uh, if you look out the radar tonight after class out in Texas, these are ongoing uh, in southern Texas and the panhandle of Texas. You can see these uh, guys ongoing out there uh, as we speak. Uh, two parts of a classic supercell, you have this precipitation-free base. Um, uh, and this is generally more on, you know, if we're thinking of a supercell assuming from west to east, this is more on the uh, western side of the supercell. Um, precipitation free base is the most likely spot where, you know, you might see your wall cloud, your funnel cloud, and your tornado. Um, then you have, um, you know, more on the eastern side on the, you know, uh, the more ominous side where the heavier rain is, this is where you can get your really heavy rain, your stronger winds, uh, and your hail on the front side uh, of the storm. Uh, looking at supercells from above, um, you, you know, the classic shape is the hook echo. Uh, and you can see this here actually from our radar uh, from November 2018, this uh, supercell uh, that rolled through Atlantic Beach, actually, uh, if I remember right, in right in the middle of the night, but this hook echo is kind of a telltale sign. And if you have a tornado or at least a wall cloud, it's gonna be right in uh, this little area here. Uh, and then this area, heavier rainfall and reflectivity is gonna be uh, where uh, you're gonna find your higher winds and uh, your hail and your torrential rainfall. We also get tornadoes during tropical systems. Um, which makes sense, um, you know, tropical systems on the whole are rotating systems, so naturally they're gonna be a good conduit uh, for tornadoes to form. Uh, if you were to divide a tropical system up into quadrants, uh, the northeast quadrant or the right front quadrant is the uh, uh, one that is uh, most likely to spawn tropical tornadoes, but all parts of a tropical cyclone can potentially uh, spawn a, a, a tornado. They're just not as likely. Um, these are particularly dangerous because they can uh, lead to an increase of uh, damage uh, and, and uh, fatalities on top of what the tropical cyclone is already doing. They're generally weak, 
um, and they're generally associated with uh, rain bands, but they can occur any time, uh, day or night. And what makes these so dangerous, especially, is there's often not a lot of lead time. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have the same sort of uh, nudgers or signals on radar and satellite uh, that we have with classic supercells uh, that we see with tropical tornadoes. So the lead time on these are super short. We can also get water spouts, which is, you know, a tornado basically over water. They're most common on summer morning, uh, summer mornings, um, and they don't necessarily have to be attached to a thunderstorm. You can see them come out of cumulus clouds as well. Um, they're generally weak, um, but they, you know, winds have been noted to come up to 100 miles per hour uh, at times on these features. They're really difficult to warn for, and they're really difficult to uh, pick out on radar generally because you know on radar the the storm or even you know just the little shower that's producing them doesn't really look like uh, anything so we we do want to know about these um, so starting to circle back here tornadoes versus funnel clouds um, ask yourself these questions do we have rotation critically does it extend to the ground again if it doesn't stick, extend to the ground it's a funnel cloud versus if it's on the ground it's a tornado um, we want to know well what, what is the damage like do we have homes completely swept off their foundations or do we just have tiles uh, uh, knocked off um, be clear about you know is it happening right now or did it happen recently we want to know a time or how many minutes ago uh, it occurred and is it over the water? Because you know, if it's over the water, it's a water spell. And then as soon as it comes on land, uh, it, it is a uh, tornado. One last way to report Twitter. You can follow us on uh, at uh, NWS Moorhead City, uh, and you can tweet at us. Um, uh, your report also attach a picture or a video only if it is safe to do so. Uh, example tweet down here at the bottom, one inch diameter hail in Cape Carteret at uh, 425, or just a few uh, minutes ago, uh, the tweets are time stamped. All right, so we're gonna have a uh, informal uh, little quiz here, uh, and I want you to answer this in the uh, question uh, section of your chat box here. Um, I, I want you to tell me, are these uh, funnel clouds, and the main hint here is these are not rotating. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I mean, they look, um, you know, like a triangular, you know, uh, you know, extensions from the uh, clouds that looks like they even may be uh, touching the ground, but they are not uh, rotating. So are they funnel clouds uh, or not? And I will uh, give folks a few, a uh, couple seconds here to uh, type in their response. All right, getting a whole slew of them, Andrew, Tom, uh, and, you know, Eric popped in here. Um, so, no, these are not uh, funnel clouds. Um, if they're not rotating, it's not a funnel. Um, these are referred to as SCUD clouds, which, as I learned just today, SCUD is actually an acronym for Scattered Cumulus Under Deck. Um, so... Uh, this is, you know, if it's not rotating, uh, it's scud. So when you're reporting this stuff to us, it looks scary, uh, certainly, but these are harmless. Now, if it is rotating, that is something we want to know about. Uh, quickly, just going to touch on these as we're uh, running a little short on time. Um, we measure tornado damage with the enhanced Vegeta scale. Um, tornadoes are classified based on the damage uh, that they uh, cause. Uh, to objects. Again, the majority of the tornadoes that we're going to be looking at are EF0, maybe EF, EF1. When we talk about significant tornadoes, then we're starting to get, in, or strong tornadoes, then we're starting to get into uh, EF2 uh, or greater. Uh, if there is a tornado, we uh, send out a, a storm survey team, uh, and basically what we do is we go out and we take a look at the damage, how, you know, in particular, we're looking at well, how are the uh, trees? Um, how how the trees fallen? Are they are they crisscrossing? Um, is it more chaotic, or is everything laid out in a, a uh, in a straight line? 
uh, I use uh, the tree example here. If trees are crisscrossed uh, more than in a straight line, uh, when they're crossing each other, that is a more telltale sign uh, of a uh, tornado uh, coming through. Um, uh, but if we have a microburst coming through um, that came through, the trees are generally, you're no, you'll notice they're more parallel to each other. So they're going to be laying side by side. And that's more indicative of straight line winds versus, uh, you know, rotating, rapidly rotating winds that will result in trees crossing each other. So here, because they're kind of line, laying out in a straight line, uh, this is more indicative of a uh, microburst. All right, so we basically hit all the points here. So we're going to do a uh, do a, a few poll questions here and have a little quiz just to make sure uh, you've uh, retained uh, see what you've learned uh, through this lesson. So I'm going to put up this slide here and then I'm going to put up a, a poll question for us. First question I want to ask you is, is this a tornado or is this a funnel cloud? Um, and I want to draw your attention to this particular spot of the photo uh, right here. It looks like something uh, is getting kicked up on the ground. So I'm going to uh, Pop this up here. Let's see if this poll question uh, is going to launch. All right. So is that a funnel cloud or is that a tornado? And again, it looks like we have some dust being kicked up uh, on the ground. And I will give us about five to ten more seconds. Alrighty then, so uh, it looks like I closed out the poll here, but everybody uh, gave the correct response here. Um, this is a tornado. Uh, it's You can see here we have debris on the ground, so even though you can't see the condensation funnel, uh, the circulation loft has made contact with the ground, so this is a tornado. Um, a nice resource that you might be able to have to report any sort of weather to us in terms of uh, fog or rain or you know hail or wind damage or anything like that is Mping. Uh, open, uh, it's an open source uh, app where you can report uh, precipitation types or weather to your area. Uh, you can use it through Apple or Android. Uh, you can uh, use uh, those reports are sent to us so we can see them and they're also uh, anonymous. If you want to know more about that, you can visit. Uh, this uh, website down here at the bottom, mping.nssl.noaa.gov. Uh, and again, download this presentation and uh, you'll have that link accessible. Your reports are critical to us, again, uh, because that can help us issue our life-saving uh, warnings. Um, for our warnings to be most effective, we issue them before severe weather occurs and we don't issue them uh, for non-severe uh, events. The more reports we get, the clearer uh, picture that we have of how well we are doing with our warnings. Um, you know, real-time real reports are crucial and we, and we want those, but even reports uh, received the next day are extremely helpful to us, especially when we're going back through the data uh, the next day uh, verifying our uh, warnings. It is a myth that the Weather Service is already aware of ongoing severe weather. Um, so, you know, we want to hear your report, no matter what's going on, even if it's a high impact event, we want to know uh, your report for the previous, you know, reason that, you know, the more reports we get, the clearer of a picture uh, that we get. So if you see something um, severe, give us, a, give us a call and we will get that info down. So quick review here, when should you contact us? If you see a tornado or a funnel cloud, make sure you confirm the rotation first, give us a call. Hail of any size, give us a call. Wind damage, trees down, structural, uh, whatever, give us a call. If you see any flooding, closed roads or streams, give us a call. And if you see any really heavy rainfall, two inches uh, in a day or two inches in less than an hour, uh, let us know about it. We want to know. Um, Again, the ways you can report this info to us, 
the toll-free number listed here. The, uh, you can send, uh, send us an email or you can reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter or report through COCA Raws. When should you not call us? You know, if you have a non-severe report, uh, you should have wind damage if you're gonna report strong winds. Um, a non-specific report isn't gonna uh, help us much. Don't just say we have heavy rain without a measurement or it's really windy without an estimate or report of damage. And again, lightning does not necessarily make a severe thunderstorm and we have ways of detecting a lightning. So you don't need to call us just to report that. Uh, otherwise, what else you can report as we get into the winter season, you can report snowfall. We go more in depth to this in our winter sky warn, or if you get any sort of uh, accumulation of ice. If you're interested in reporting uh, winter wise, we'll have winter sky warn classes uh, as we get later into the year. Uh, so we have a few more classes uh, coming up here. Two more basic sky warm classes uh, in May. Uh, we have an advanced sky warm for those that want to get more nitty gritty into the science. And then the flood and tropical sky warms are going to be coming up next as we get into uh, hurricane season. Uh, we always post information about our future classes on our website, weather.gov slash Newport. Uh, and we also post this info on social media. Uh, our goal is effectively that you report to us year round, whether it be snow, hail, high winds, flooding, uh, or uh, any of that. We want to know about those reports. Uh, you can also stay current with us. We have recordings uh, of old Skywarn classes on uh, this particular website, which you can bookmark. You can find it on YouTube um, for both winter and spring Skywarn. And this is a good time. This can be good to do a refresher at any point. Uh, to go over the material um, that we just reviewed today. That's uh, the end. I'm aware we ran a, a little bit over on